can say hello to everyone and wish you a warm welcome to this webinar on unsent letters. My name is Anna Rebecca Solvog, and I am speaking to you tonight from Stavanger on the west coast of Norway, where I am professor of New Testament studies at Vid Specialized University. This webinar is part of a webinar series hosted by the books known only by title Project. The project explores the gendered structures of first millennium imagined libraries and is directed by Professor Marianne Bjelland Kartsov at the University of Oslo and Professor Liv Ingeborg Lied at MF School of Theology, Religion and Society. The project is situated at the Center for Advanced Study at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters in Oslo. And I was very lucky to be a fellow at the project in October and November of last year. So today's webinar will focus on unsent letters. Many letters were never sent. Letter writers never dispatched them and the addressees never received them. Some letters may not even have been written. Some such letters are known only by title or by mention in a host text and are thus part of, our, uh, of an imagined correspondence. Yet other letters come down to us, not as discrete documents, but as part, parts of collections copied and circulated in books. Are we, as readers and interpreters, the ones who think them into being as documents that were sent, carried, performed, received, and archived? This webinar will explore the many letters that crisscross the imaginary landscapes of first millennium literatures. And we have four amazing panelists to address this topic. The panelists will study letter sending as a trope, including its gendered aspects. They will look into the functions of ancient literary uh, fiction in epistolary form, explore the generative powers of collections, communication, and archives, and discuss the stakes scholarship has in making potentially, uh, potentially imaginary dossiers into real documents. Before I introduce our speakers, let me mention some practicalities. Each panelist has 10 minutes for their presentation. And we will do all the presentations first, and then we will have a joint Q&A session afterwards. Dr. Esther Braunsmith, who is a fellow at the project, is our technical support today. And I think that she has some information for us as well. Esther? Yes, thank you. So I am technical support. If you're having any problems, you can message me. Um, but also I will be helping with the Q&A. So to make things easier, when you think of questions that you want to ask, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask those. Don't just ask them in chat because sometimes chat can move along and it can be hard to track who's asked what and whether it's been answered. So just use the Q&A when the time comes, feel free to add questions as we're going and then we'll get back to them at the end. Um, and I think that's all for now. Just keep in mind when you're in the chat that unless you select panelists and attendees, um, others can't see, but feel free to say hi to folks using pan panelists and attendees. Thank you. Okay, then I think we're ready to get started. So our first speaker today is David Frank Perler. David is professor of religion and Aurelio chair in the appreciation of scripture at Boston University. He will speak to us on the fiction of the seven letters in the apocalypse. David, please. Okay. Okay. So the book of Revelation includes in its introductory section seven letters to congregations in specific cities in Asia Minor. It has been customary for commentators to take these letters, each dictated by an aspect or emanation of God, as actually directed to specific ecclesiae and so actually reflecting their social situations, 
local persecution or dissension, prophetic rivalry, heresy, levels of spiritual commitment, and harassment by so-called Jews. By reading these letters as historical messages to individual assemblies, scholars can thus ground their larger assumptions about the Christ movement in Asia Minor. But in this brief paper, I argue that these letters were never directed to actual Christ assemblies, that they address practices and conflicts of the most general sort in the perspective of John of Patmos, and that this sequence of seven letters dictated by a divine spirit, I will call the Holy One, represents a repudiation of the earliest Pauline letter collections. Indeed, this act of repudiation corresponds to the author's general repudiation of Pauline teachings about sexuality, kashrut, and Jewishness. Thus, I view the materials in chapters two and three as an epistolary fiction. The apocalypse is, of course, a prophecy, first and foremost. It was meant for oral performance and involved John's possession by a major spirit as well as otherworldly visions and travel. In this context, the appropriation of epistolary conventions must reflect John's effort to establish authority, not only for the visions that start in chapter four, but for the very prophetic voice itself, for the status of the Holy One as speaking spirit. Besides the letters from the Holy One in chapters two to three, the apocalypse uses epistolary elements from the very start, John to the seven assemblies in Asia, and then a greeting from John's spirit, the one who was, is and was and is to come, as well as from Jesus Christ, firstborn of the dead. Then John's heavenly spirit commands him to write in a biblion what you see and send it to the seven assemblies. In this way, the entire visionary narrative becomes a sort of letter ideally to be distributed to seven assemblies. And in fact, the whole thing ends with a closing formula quite like Paul's. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. So why epistolary forms? It turns a prophecy into a letter, but very unlike Jeremiah's letter to exiles, given the visionary materials in the apocalypse, and certainly unlike typical apocalyptic texts. Revelation's use of epistolary forms, in addition to call narrative and heavenly ascent, suggested at the time of its composition, the letter had gained some authority as a genre, indeed as a material collection. That new authority in the circulated letter collection must, I argue, derive from the Pauline assemblies and their rudimentary collections of Paul's letters. Whatever the rudimentary forms of, or collections in which they circulated in the later first century of the common era, Paul's letters had established a new form of textual authority, the letter as a new means of constructing leadership, proposing uniformity, bridging the space between far-flung assemblies, creating, in Judith Liu's words, a distinctive social sphere with its own internal conventions, its own sets of relationships, its own language of relationality. Thus, we see its impact in the seven letters of Ignatius, the two letters of Peter and the three letters of John, all deliberate expressions of the new Christian epistolary style. But in Revelation, the source of messages is not a human letter writer at all, but the Holy One himself, a divine spirit that speaks through John. Thus, I argue that John of Patmos seeks to exceed, even denigrate, the rising authority of Pauline collections through transmitting letters from the Holy One himself, displacing his own authorship for the authorship of God and ultimately shifting textual authority from human epistle to the apocalyptic vision. A letter from some human apostle would pale against a letter from the Holy One himself. Obviously in the first century, the supernatural source of revelatory and didactic authority was a consuming issue as Paul himself makes clear in several of his letters. So letters that convey the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword and the like would certainly be intended to exceed Paul an apostle sent through Jesus Christ. I should add that this impulse to exceed Pauline authority also reflects the actual admonitions of the Holy One. For the practices he condemns, porneia, idolothuta, are those Paul could be seen as allowing. 
and the so-called Jews are most likely Paul's Gentile believers. The seven letters thus represent John's effort both to represent a vividly supernatural voice through a particularly human genre, and in that way to eclipse Paul's authority, epistolary and apostolic both. Indeed, whether or not there were sevenfold Pauline collections in circulation, the Holy One's proclivity to pre present everything in sevens would make the Apocalypse's letters veritable expressions of heaven. At this point, I want to touch on the contents of the letters as their admonitions and commandments seem to imply the Holy One's discernment of actual goings on, local geographies, local tribulations, local conflicts. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is, says the Holy One to Pergamon. Yet you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, who was killed among you where Satan lives. This is oracular language and does not in any way require actual situations in historical Christ assemblies. Moreover, polemical details are duplicated across the letters. Synagogues of Satan show up twice, and likewise Nicolaitans and prophets teaching Pornea. These figures serve as opponent fictions in Michael Somer's convenient formulation. It doesn't mean that the synagogues of Satan and false prophets weren't in some sense historical enemies for John of Patmos and his spirit, only that their specific activities with the specific assemblies enumerated in the letters must be regarded as fictions. But then why arrange their threats among the seven cities? I know your works, you have a name of being alive, but you are dead. In such condemnations and commendations, John performs the role of omniscient spirit. The admonitions are either quite general or they are cryptic, offering the pretense of divine discernment into local activities. I know your afflictions and your poverty, even though you are rich. The Holy One uses the literary conceit of the letter, letter, letter collection to distribute key conflicts across a map of individual assemblies, regardless of their local relevance or even whether John knew about them. The result is the construction of an authoritative divine presence, an omniscient discerning spirit that has appropriated the forms of letter to give the impression of local knowledge and broad geographical networks. If the letters in Revelation 2 to 3 are fictions, what do we learn? What is the payoff? First, it allows us to discuss John's polemics in more general rather than ecclesia specific terms. So called Jews, false prophets teaching Pornea, Nicolaitans, and the deep things of Satan, these crises cannot be located or isolated to specific cities in Asia Minor. They represent John's general, if pressing, concerns about rivalries in the Christ movement in late first century Asia Minor. They are quite important for the history of the Asia Minor Christ movement, but not in the context of specific cities. Second, it gives us a sense of how the Pauline tradition was interpreted by its detractors in the Christ movement, by a prophet who cleaved resolutely to Jewish priestly purity practices and expected others to do the same. Indeed, we get a sense not only of how Pauline teachings were regarded, but of their material media as well, the letter collection. Paul's letters and those in his name carried such benefits as textuality, local knowledge or its pretense, intimacy with addressees, and a confident sense of geographic interconnection. Prophets like John clearly performed in oral conditions. Yet, as we see in the second century ascension of Isaiah and Shepherd of Hermas, these prophets were clearly integrating textual forms into their communication. John, of course, is concerned for the integrity of the written word for guarding his revelations, cursing those who might add or subtract from his text, but also that it should not simply be circulated for private reading. In all these concerns, I think he's responding to the growing use and ongoing redactions of Pauline text and circulation. And this brings me to the third takeaway from the fiction of the seven letters, that it does allow us to date Revelation in, re in relationship to early Pauline letter collections. 
this may not make as big a difference in absolute terms since revelation remains a product of the later first century of the common era. But a material religious context for the composition of revelation is undoubtedly an improvement on past efforts to justify Irenaeus's dating under Domitian or to find historical evidence for the particular thlipsis that landed John on Patmos Island. It also places the composition of this text in relationship to other material textualities and to the increasing hegemony of the Pauline tradition among Asia Minor Christ assemblies. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. So our next speaker is Greg Given. Greg is lecturer on New Testament and early Christianity at Harvard Divinity School. The title of his presentation is the curious case of the correspondence between Mary of Castobola and Ignatius of Antioch. Craig, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am excited to be here. I want to first thank Esther and Rebecca for their organizational efforts in putting this panel together and running it today, as well as the group leaders and the fellows of the Books Known Only by Title Project, for the invitation to participate in this uh, exciting and frighteningly distinguished webinar series. I am uh, grateful and humbled to be a part of it. If you have heard of the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, or you have read them, you have probably read them in the context of a modern collection of the so-called apostolic fathers. Such editions usually include seven letters written by Ignatius to a variety of communities around Western Anatolia, as he is supposedly being dragged in chains by soldiers from Antioch to Rome, where he expects, indeed he hopes, to meet execution by the jaws of beasts. This seven letter collection, however, is only one version of the Ignatian letter collection. There are a number of others. The scholarship usually breaks the complex textual tradition down into three major recensions. Now, I will argue in a book that I'm hopefully finishing this year that I think this is an overly simplistic model and does not adequately account for the full range of the manuscript evidence. But for our purposes today, it will suffice to simply note that the middle recension is what you are most likely familiar with from our modern editions of the Apostolic Fathers, while the long recension is a collection of 12 or 13 letters, depending on the manuscript, which will be my focus today. Now, as you see here in this list, the long recension begins with an exchange between Ignatius and one Mary of Casabola. Within the context of the literary phenomenon of the ancient letter collection, this exchange is remarkable for at least two reasons. First, it's relatively unusual to find both sides of a correspondence in such a letter collection. Famously, of course, there's the correspondence between Pliny and Trajan, there's Jesus and Abgar, there's Paul and Seneca, but it's still a relatively rare phenomenon. It's rare enough to be notable. More rare, however, is the fact that one of these letters is written by a woman. Now, we know, of course, that plenty of women in antiquity wrote letters. Uh, Bagnal and Cribiore published a whole book of them. But for all of the letters written by women that survive on scraps of papyrus or ostraca, there are vanishingly few letters attributed to women included in letter collections handed down from antiquity in literary manuscripts. While acknowledging that there is, of course, no way of knowing whether this letter attributed to uh, Mary was in fact written by a woman, Ross Shepard Kramer has noted that this is the only letter attributed to a woman writer among Christian literature down to the sixth century. So today I want to ponder with you all, what functions might this curious correspondence between Ignatius and Mary have served in its literary context? both the context of the immediate letter collection within which it is included and the broader context of epistolary literature in antiquity. So let's begin by looking at these texts. The Greek long recension of the letters of Ignatius begins like this. Mary, a proselyte of Jesus Christ, 
to Ignatius, God carrier, the most blessed bishop of the Apostolic Church at Antioch, beloved in God, the Father, and Jesus, greetings and farewell. We always pray that you may have joy and health in him. Relatively standard uh, epistolary prescript, um, perhaps familiar to us from any number of letters we might have read uh, from Christian antiquity. But after this prescript, Mary then gets immediately into the purpose of her correspondence. Since Christ wonderfully has made known among us to be son of the living God, made human in later times through the Virgin Mary from the seed of David and Abraham, in accordance with the voices which spoke of him in advance in the choir of the prophets, on this account, we ask that in your wisdom, you deem us worthy to be sent Morris, our companion, as bishop of our native Neapolis, which is near Zarbus as well as Eulogius as presbyter of Casabola, that we not be deprived of people to preside over the divine word. Hmm. So we see here that Mary is writing to Ignatius to ask that he appoint a bishop and presbyter over her own community, which it seems perhaps has just recently sprung up. She then goes on to acknowledge that both of these candidates she is recommending are quite young and have only recently been made priests. So the bulk of her letter is actually concerned with defending the youth of these would-be ecclesiastical leaders, assuring Ignatius of their piety and wisdom by comparison to a number of young leaders from the biblical past. In closing her argument, however, Mary seems to acknowledge that her request could seem a bit uncouth. But time would fail me if I should endeavor to enumerate all those who in their youth were well-pleasing to God and trusted by God with prophecy, priesthood, or kingship. Those already mentioned are enough as a reminder. But I do not want you to think me excessive or ostentatious. I have put down these words not to teach you, but simply to prompt the memory of my Father in God. For I know my own position and do not compare myself with such as you. Now in Ross Kramer's discussion of this letter, she notes that there's an unmistakable echo here of 1 Timothy 2.11's proscription of women teaching or having authority over a man. Within the context of reception of 1 Timothy and late ancient conversations about women's prophesying or writing books, Kramer argues that Mary's letter is at least a signal that some readers would not find it completely unbelievable for a woman to write and to write directly to a powerful bishop with a appeal. Moreover, that such writing could be accomplished without running afoul of the Pauline proscription against women teaching or having authority over men. Ignatius, for his part, in the reply that immediately follows, is not particularly scandalized. He praises Mary's agile recollection of, scripture, of scriptural exemplars and he confirms that he has immediately fulfilled the staffing requests that she has made. But most interesting to me is how he begins his letter. Uh, after the prescript, he then writes, Sight is indeed better than writing, as being one of the company of the senses. It not only honors the recipient as it reveals friendship, but also is enriched all the more when it receives in return the desire for even better things. But as they say, the second harbor of refuge is the practice of writing, which through your faith we have received as a convenient haven from far away, since through this means we have seen the good within you. So here we find a beautiful articulation of what is a relatively common epistolary trope, the idea that letter writing functions as a substitute for physical presence. Ignatius then goes on, for all wise woman, the souls of the good resemble the purest springs, for they bring passers-by to, the, to drink of them through their form, even should they not be thirsty. So your intelligence invites us, as though we were commanded, to partake of the divine draughts which are flowing forth in your soul. Now, on one level, there is here a gesture at another commonplace idea in the landscape of ancient epistolography, namely that the letter represents a sort of encapsulation of one's soul. This is perhaps famously or most famously articulated by Demetrius in his treatise on style, where he writes that the letter, like the dialogue, should abound in glimpses of character. It may be said that everybody reveals his own soul in his letters. 
And so we can imagine the upshot, the value of including such a reflection on the power of the epistolary form at the opening of a letter collection which charts the dramatic story and urgent teachings of a venerated bishop and martyr. While Ignatius is commenting on the power of Mary's letter, it would be easy enough for a reader to see his words as applicable to Ignatius's own letters. The reader would then be invited to consider the nourishing value of the documents that they hold in their hands. But this observation still leaves open the question, why Mary? Why a woman corresponded here? Could such a reflection on the epistolary form not have been accomplished by a letter with a young priest or a lay man? I don't have a complete answer to these questions, but I want to suggest two possible explanations that function on somewhat different levels. On the level of the Ignatian letter collection, Mary is certainly functioning here as an exemplar of pious women. Later in the collection, in the letter to Hero, Ignatius salutes Morris, the very bishop who Mary's uh, requested to be appointed. And then he counsels Hero to speak to the serious-minded Mary, my most learned daughter, and the church which is at her household. May I be a ransom for her, the pattern for pious women. This word that Stuart translates as ransom, antipsukon, is a very typically Ignatian word that crops up numerous times. Notably, in the long recension, we find it in Ignatius's letter to the Tarsians, where he writes, the presbyters should be subordinate to the bishop, the deacons to the presbyters, the people to the deacons. I am the ransom for those who maintain this good order. Now, if we think back to Mary's letter, and especially its purpose, she is doubtless displaying her intelligence, her learning, her piety, her knowledge of scripture, but she is also displaying her concern for the maintenance of good order. She is exemplary, it seems, because she knows her place, and she respects the authority of the church hierarchy, so much so that she would write to ask Ignatius to send her some hierarchy. If we turn our attention finally to the literary comparanda beyond this collection, and here I will close, we do encounter a somewhat different possibility. Where else in ancient literature do we find letters written by women and where we find both sides of an epistolary exchange? Two genres come to mind. First, the ethopoetic letter collections of the second sophistic, those attributed to Alien, Alciphron, and Philostratus, which appear to present the literary elite's imagination of the interior lives of non-elites, people like farmers, merchants, sex workers, etc. Second, we also find women's letters and both sides of a correspondence in the ancient novels, mm -hmm. uh, texts like Leucope and Clytophon and Calirroway. Mm -hmm. Now, with such comprehend in view, we might ask, would ancient readers have seen Mary's letter to Ignatius and Ignatius's reply as something like fictional signposts? If so, how would such fictionality have interacted with the apparently exemplary status of Mary in the collection? Might such suggestions of fictionality help explain why Mary's letter actually drops out of the long recension in its Latin version and in some of the Greek manuscripts? I could enumerate further questions all day long, but I'm already over time here, so I think I'll need to leave it here, but thank you all. Thank you uh, for your paper, Greg. So next up is Tommy Wasserman. He is professor of biblical studies at the Anska University College of uh, Kristiansand here in Norway. And he's also a professor of New Testament studies at Örebro School of Theology in Sweden. Tommy will speak to us um, tonight on a uh, Laodicean epistle in the landscape of ancient Christian memory. Take it away, Tommy. Yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organization of this webinar. And uh, it's nice to see over 40 participants. Hello guys, I can't see you, but you can see me. And hopefully you can also see my uh, PowerPoint slides. So this third presentation will be different. Uh, there will be a Swedish accent here. Uh, and uh, also I will talk from my slides rather than uh, a paper which is unwritten and without any. <laughs> so I will talk about these slides. There is an echo now, so if everyone 
except me can turn on off their microphones. That would be helpful. That possible. So the starting point for this Laodikean letter, and that is uh, uh, a bit ambiguous, this uh, title, a Laodikean letter, is the verse in Colossians 4.16. And you can see uh, also in modern translations that this is indeed ambiguous in the Greek text. Uh, the NRSV has it, and when this letter has been read among you, uh, that is Colossians, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you read also the letter from, from Laodicea. And the NASB has, when this letter is read among you, you have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and you for your part read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So uh, my letter is Paul, so to speak, uh, uh, implied, the implied author here. And uh, so you have ambiguity in the Greek text, which is reflected in the variety of even modern translations. And of course, this led early on, this gap led to several traditions, even competing traditions. And uh, here you can see uh, Bishop Joseph Lightfoot of Durham uh, studying. And uh, this is his uh, commentary. I can recommend it very philological. Uh, his commentary to the Colossians, and uh, he has an excursus on this uh, Laodicean epistle. And he says that the expression in the original makes no such demand. It's equally competent for us to explain ten ek Laodiceas, either the letter written from Laodicea or the letter to be procured from Laodicea, as the context may suggest, etc. And actually, his, he uh, outlines a whole variety of possibilities here about this elusive Laodicean letter. So we have all sorts of uh, combinations and therefore also competing traditions. Uh, for example, an epistle written by the Laodiceans to St. Paul, uh, and this is mentioned by Theodore of Mopsuestia and also in the translation uh, the Syriac Peshitta uh, translates uh, in this way. Um, and it could, could be to Paul or Epaphras or Colosse. And uh, a second alternative is an epistle written by St. Paul from Laodicea. Uh, so this could be then extant. It could be First Timothy, which is the uh, main contender. Thessalonians or Galatians. This interpretation is reflected in John of Damascus and in Theoph Theophylact and uh, Philoxenian, another Syriac uh, trans version, and Codex Alexandrinus in a paratext, which we will see soon. So, uh, so first, so he's talking about First Timothy here. A third possibility an epistle addressed to the Laodiceans by John or maybe St. Paul himself. Um, it could be, for example, Ephesians, because um, in some manuscripts you don't have this address to the Ephesians, it's lacking. Uh, so uh, Marcion, apparently according to Tertullian, he talks about this epistle, the Laodicean, as a uh, as being actually the Ephesians. And finally, uh, an epistle from Paul to the Laodiceans, which uh, is today preserved in some manuscripts, an actual apocryphal epistle, uh, purported, of course, to be from Paul. And uh, there is uh, the oldest uh, and most important witness to such a letter from Paul to the Laodiceans is found in Codex Fuldensis. And here I have a few slides with some theory, which uh, may also be applied perhaps for several of our presenters here, we can think together. This is Tobias Niklas who published an article on uh, New Testament canon and ancient Christian landscapes of memory. And he speaks about canonical texts like Colossians, for example, in this case, 
as a starting point of later speculation, interpretation, and the creation of new stories connected to various places. And this is reflected in pseudepigrapha and paratexts also, uh, interestingly, like subscriptions, scholia and commentary, and even textual variants. Uh, and as I said, there may be competing traditions and competing landscapes of memories, therefore, so to speak. Here is another um, cite uh, quote from Eric Sherbenske, who speaks about paratexts. And he speaks specifically here about the Euthalian edition uh, of the Corpus Paulinum and all the apparatus, all the uh, paratexts, titles, and, uh, and uh, various paratexts. The sources deemed authentic were used to reconstruct Paul's life, which in turn authenticated them as sources for readers of this edition of Corpus Paulinum. In a related manner, these extra canonical traditions supplied a proto Orthodox meta narrative legitimating their own claims of apostolicity and orthodoxy. The inclusion of such traditions in paratexts, prologues, subscriptions, etc., even ensured their transmission as part of the very scripture they sought to authenticate. For example, the tradition that Titus was the first bishop of the Christian church, which happens to be found in the subscription to this letter, that is uh, Paul's to Titus, in Codex Coislinianus and many others uh, manuscripts later on, was transmitted through the majority text to the King James Version. So actually in a majority of manuscripts, you have this uh, tradition uh, written uh, below after the uh, letter, uh, you have this uh, information that Titus was the first bishop. And thirdly, I want also to mention Bruce Metzger, who said, uh, and I apply it to paratexts and pseudepigraphical letters, because they also satisfy curiosity, I think. It's not only a matter of, uh, of um, uh, authority and so on, but also I think uh, sometimes to satisfy curiosity, these gaps in the texts, in the imagination. Uh, he talks about a testament to the fertility of pious imagination down through the centuries and the reluctance to respect the silence of the New Testament narratives. So it's deeply human, I think, to fill in the gaps, to think uh, creatively and so on. And he's talking about, uh, his article is entitled Names for the Nameless in the New Testament. So for example, when uh, Jesus sends out, uh, was it 72 uh, uh, disciples, uh, there, there are suggestions of names for all of them uh, in the Christian traditions. So that's very interesting. It's uh, just uh, pious imagination. Um, so John of Damascus, uh, he suggests that this is uh, actually 1 Timothy, this Laodicean letter. And uh, then we must place it in Paul's biography. And this could be, uh, it's beyond acts. It's what happened next. He, there was a second imprisonment that Eusebius uh, speaks about, where you can fit in... Um, uh, first and second Timothy. And here uh, John says uh, in his comment on Colossians 4.16, he talks about first Timothy. So that is alternative two. Some say that it's, it is by no means the letter that Paul sent to them, for he does not talk about the letter to the Laodiceans, but the letter from them to Paul written from Laodicea. So some he talks about uh, another alternative, which is alternative one, but he himself subscribes to alternative two. Here is a scholion. Uh, so here you have several paratexts. It's from a New Testament manuscript. Uh, and you have here the, in the text, Laodiceas, uh, you have a symbol and uh, a comment on uh, what this letter from Laodicea is. And here you have actually John of Damascus, his, his comment you have here. 
And then you have a subscription uh, further below, which also then makes the connection to First Timothy in the subscription after the, the ending, the telos of the, of the letter text, you have this uh, uh, subscription that uh, speaks about the connection to the First Timothy. Here's, here is Theophylact of Ockrid. Uh, he says, which one then is the letter from Laodicea? It is First Timothy, so he agrees. For this, he, Paul wrote from Laodicea. But some say that the Laodiceans sent the letter to Paul, but I don't know what of such, what of such a letter would be of use to them. So that's why this uh, alternative one has not been so popular because a letter written from the Laodiceans is that that is not as valuable as a letter from the Apostle Paul, of course. Here is an example of uh, a subscription and it's uh, found in Codex Alexandri Alexandrinus, uh, fifth century. And after First Timothy, you have this subscription uh, to Timothy uh, first, Egrafe Apu Laodikeias, written from Laodikea. So here is this tradition in the subscription that it is First Timothy was written from Laodikea. And then uh, there are competing traditions even in these subscriptions. Uh, so it's not only written from Laodicea, but Nicopolis, Macedonia, Athens, just an example. If you go through all the manuscripts, you see that there are competing traditions, but Laodicea is the earliest and the most widespread. And interestingly, it grows also these subscriptions, the earliest, they don't have a place at all, but then you see the place from Laodicea, and then you see uh, Metropolis, Phrygias, Tespakatia, you, you, it builds up. So the subscriptions tend to grow through the centuries. And Laodicea is uh, a bit problematic in the biography of Paul. I won't go into this map, but uh, there is a problem. Uh, how can it be written from Laodicea? But that's a historical question in a way. But um, it may have been a problem from, for some interpreters in this uh, discussion of the identification. Here, interestingly, is alternative th uh, three. So we're talking now about an epistle from Paul to the Laodiceans. And this is Codex Buenerianus. Uh, and it's uh, a diglot, it's Greek and Latin, and it's dated to the ninth century. And here is. Um, uh, another different text written much later. Uh, it's a commentary on Matthew. It has nothing to do with, so try to neglect this, uh, this uh, scrib uh, scribbling here. It's actually uh, a space in the Greek text of Philemon, which the scribe did not, did not have. So he left just space for it to be filled in later. And then he wrote this title to the Laodiceans, uh, here, here is the insipid, just the title, and then there is nothing more. Perhaps uh, he changed his mind and didn't want to copy, copy it out, but it is found in Codex Fuldensis, which is a Latin Vulgate uh, from the sixth century. And this is the oldest witness then to uh, this uh, letter to the Laodiceans. And it's placed here, between Colossians and 1 Timothy, which is interesting because we have been talking about the connection between Colossians and 1 Timothy. And uh, the Muratorian fragment has uh, also this tradition. I will, I have uh, passed my time, but I want to show you uh, just this extract from this apocryphal letter, which is very interesting. This is the letter closing and you can see uh, this is a translation, of course. On the left, you have the Pauline letter, different Pauline letters. And I want to highlight uh, the last uh, snippet. So we have Colossians 4.16. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And in this apocryphal letter, in the 20th, 20th verse, you have this 
a corresponding uh, note and see that this letter is read to the Colossians and that of the Colossians among you. So you have a mutual connection here and really establishing this as um, filling in the gap in the canonical Pauline letters. So that's about, that's what I have for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy, for your presentation. So our final speaker today is Benjamin G. Wright. Benjamin's, Benjamin is University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Religion Studies at Lehigh University. His pres presentation is called Unsent Letters, the Epistle of Jeremiah and the Letter of Aristias. Benjamin, I give the word to you. Thank you. Everybody can see my PowerPoint okay? Perfect. Um, first of all, I also want to thank the organizers and everyone connected with Books Known Only by Title for this invitation. Um, I'm immediately going to transgress the boundaries and go back before the first millennium. Um, I, hope, I hope I will have the uh, forbearance and forgiveness of, um, of the organizers. Um, but I want to take a look briefly at the Epistle of Jeremiah and then a little bit more at the letter of Aristius to think about the whole issue of letters that are unsent. So let's start with the Epistle of Jeremiah. It's framed, the beginning is a copy of the letter that Jeremiah sent to those who would be led as captives into Babylon. And so one of the questions is, is this a letter? It does not have a standard epistolary greeting or closing. It's clearly modeled on Jeremiah 29. And if we look at Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29 itself does not have a standard epistolary um, salutation or closing um, as well. It's intended to predate the letter of Jeremiah 29. So remember, if you remember, Jeremiah 29 is Jeremiah's letter to those who are exiled in Babylon. This is a letter that would go to those who would be exiled. So before they're exiled, they're still in the land. Um, the letter combines the anti-idolatry polemic of Jeremiah 10, with a letter from Jeremiah 29 and some formulations from Jeremiah 16. Without going into all of the permutations, the likely date, depending on whether you think the letter of Jeremiah is written in Hebrew or Aramaic or in Greek, would be somewhere in the Hellenistic period from the fourth to the second century BCE. So I wanna take seriously that this is a copy of a letter that is expected to be a letter from Jeremiah. So one of the questions is, is it an unsent letter? Unlike Jeremiah 29, the epistle of Jeremiah ostensibly comes from Jeremiah to address these who are still in the land. They haven't been sent into exile yet. And so um, I agree with almost all scholars who say that this is a pseudepigraphic letter. And if you combine that with the fact that its, its addressees are still in the land, might suggest that this letter was not sent at all. Verse 2 points to a long time after Jeremiah. Um, of course, in Jeremiah 25 and 29, we have the 70 years of Jeremiah. But in verse 2, we read in the epistle, when therefore you come into Babylon, you will be there for a long time, as long as seven generations. And scholars have tried to use the seven generations to date the letter. I'm not sure that you can really do that very effectively. And then he says, but after this, I will bring you from there, that is Babylon, with peace. So if the epistle of Jeremiah was composed in the Hellenistic period and in Judea as a Jeremianic pseudepigraphon, it seems likely then that it was not intended to be sent, but rather it trades on the idea that Jeremiah wrote letters for the purpose, for contemporary purposes of the person who, or persons who composed it. So why use a letter from Jeremiah? First of all, Jeremiah 10 and 29 provide the basis for the message, a letter from Jeremiah, warnings to avoid, idol, avoid idols, and the idea that God will then bring the people back from Babylon in peace. And the anti-idolatry polemic couched as Jeremianic discourse is part of then a developing and productive Jeremianic tradition, along with the traditions about Baruch, which in many cases are characterized by warnings against adultery. 
So we might then think about the epistle of Jeremiah as an unsent epistle, a copy of an unsent epistle, interestingly enough, which can be perhaps understood as a Jeremianic reminder to its readers that just as Jeremiah warned their ancestors in exile, this is the Hellenistic period readers of the text, their present is also suffused with the dangers of idolatry worship, which Jeremiah writes that they have to shun if they're going to avoid a similar fate. So I just wanted to take a real quick look at the epistle of Jeremiah as a letter that's unsent and to think about how do we know it's an unsent letter. Um, in the title, you know, unsent letters, we might think that we know when a letter is sent or unsent, um, but in fact, it's not always terribly clear. And then the question is, why a letter in this particular case, which I think, as I said, um, works to help in the present context of the letter tie this to Jeremianic discourse, which is part of a larger tradition of Jeremianic discourse that deals in many cases with warnings against idolatry. So that I don't way, go way over my time, I want to move then to the letter of Aristius. Some quick facts about the letter of Aristius. It's mid to late second century BCE Alexandria. It's a Hellenistic Jewish fiction, and I think it's completely fictional about the translation of the Septuagint made at the behest of Ptolemy II Philadelphus. The scholars have debated the genre of the work, but it's framed as a personal correspondence, as some kind of a letter from an Aristius, a Gentile courtier of Ptolemy II to his brother Philocrates. Although the letter doesn't refer, the letter of Aristius doesn't refer to itself as a letter, it doesn't have a party's formulation, a salutation, or a closing. Lutz During has made, I think, a very effective argument that it has epistolary features. And the three bullet points you see there are the three main features that, that During has, um, has pointed out. At the same time, though, the letter of Aristius also employs aspects of Greek historiography. And I think what happens in, in its drawing on epistolarity, as well as aspects of historiography, what it allows the author to do is to exploit the possibilities of autopsy, which are inherent in both of these genres. And that's what I want to kind of focus on a little bit as we go. But in the letter of Aristius, we hear of other letters, two which are unsent, one in paragraph six, in which the author refers to, which Aristius, our fictional author, refers to a previous correspondence in which he sent to his brother Philocrates information about the Jews that he learned from Egyptian priests. And Egyptian priests in this period become sort of the standard culture bearers of, of Egypt for Greek historians. Um, we see this in, in, in Herodotus especially. And at the very end, in paragraph 322, the same narrator says that he's going to send another correspondence with the remaining things worth saying, whatever they are. These two letters were never sent. They were never written. That's the nice thing about the letter of Aristius. We have all the things that were in the, in the uh, precy for, for today. We have uh, a letter. We have real letters, which I'll talk about in a moment. We have unwritten letters, all of which, in my estimation, are unsent. So in paragraphs 35 to 40, we have a transcript of a letter from Ptolemy to the Jewish high priest Eleazar. It is a true letter. It has an augmented salutation, greetings, and good health. It has a closing. It resembles official and private letters. And in fact, Ptolemy in the salutation uses Eleazar's title, which in these kinds of letters usually indicates equal or independent status. So Eleazar in this letter is addressed as essentially on a par with Ptolemy II. Immediately following, we have um, Eleazar's reply, which also has characteristics of the diplomatic letter, again, with a salutation and standard closing. It also uses titles to reciprocate Ptolemy's recognition of Eleazar as the ruler of the Jews. So what do these letters do? I think the epistolary frame with the transcripts of the letters support the claim to autopsy, to eyewitness account in the work which is an important source of knowledge for Greek historians. If we look at Thucydides, if we look at Herodotus, if we look at Plutarch, they all talk about 
the idea of eyewitness accounts being a main source of knowledge. In paragraph two, Aristius actually appeals to the two main sources of information, written accounts or research. So written accounts are seen as a kind of secondarily important um, source of knowledge and eyewitness accounts. So he says in paragraph six, because he has this proclivity for studying matters of religion, there's your research piece. He volunteered for the embassy to Jerusalem. There's your eyewitness piece. The entire work then relates the narrator's personal experience. He's a courtier and advisor of Ptolemy, so he has access to these official documents. And more importantly, he leads the delegation to bring translators and manuscripts back to Alexandria. So he is really an eyewitness in more ways than one, and he's kind of the, the paradigmatic Thucydidean um, um, eyewitness. He has important and official documents, and he's witnessed it all. The letters, and I think also this is, applies to the unwritten letters, contribute to the idea of vividness and argeia of the account, which is also an important aspect of, of both uh, of historiographical autopsy. And that allows the reader to encounter the past as present. And we see lots of ways in the letter of Aristius in which the text tries to um, create a vivid picture in the mind. We see the use of ekphrasis. We see the use of ethopoeia, of enargeia, right? And so the, the letter, the whole text itself is an attempt to try to bring this vivid picture of Aristius's experience into the mind of the reader. Um, in my commentary on the letter of Aristius, I argued that the use of a fictional Gentile as the narrator assures Alexandrian Jews that enlightened Gentiles like those we see in the letter of Aristius, Demetrius the librarian, Ptolemy II, Aristius himself, the narrator, they all understand things that make Jews different. And the Jews then are, are, um, are constructed to be like Greeks. They have a law that's given by a lawgiver. These laws are, inculcate ethical and moral values that Jews and Gentiles share. The epistolary framing allows the reader to have access then to a correspondence that's represented as personal and to some degree private. The readers get to listen in on a conversation between elite Gentiles in which Gent Jews are admired, their leader is acknowledged as being on a par with Ptolemy, and Jerusalem in a passage which is compared to Alexandria actually comes off better than Alexandria. So, and all of this is assured through the trope of autopsy of eyewitness on the part of the narrator. I also happen to think there's a kind of an allure of the possibility that you're reading someone else's private thoughts, right? You you're see, you you're have access to something that presumably you shouldn't have access to. So finally, the letter of Aristius, I don't think tells us anything about the real origins of the Septuagint. And so none of these letters was ever sent. The use of autopsy and letter writing in the letter of Aristius has created a kind of, I, I, I call it a kind of undead persistence in scholarship that the letter of Aristius preserves historical information about the translation. And so I, the, the question I wanna ask at the end then is, does the claim to autopsy through epistolary form, references to other correspondence and transcripts of official letters subtly enable, and here's one of the questions again of the Precy, enable a thinking of the legend into existence. Have, have scholars, as you know, whatever ancient readers thought, have scholars kind of been misled by all this stuff to think that there's some, some history here, which actually I don't think is there. Um, I don't know the answer to that for sure. I suspect so. But after all, the use of these elements in, um, in the letter of Aristius is what our author was after. And, and I wonder actually at the very end whether he might not have succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. So thank you very much. So thank you so much to you too, Benjamin. So it's my, now time to open up for questions and comments to our panelists. So remember to use the Q&A function to pose your questions.
Uh, and while we're asking for some questions to come in, I, I'd like to hear from, from the panelists whether you have uh, any qu questions or comments to um, to each other. Uh, any See any similarities or differences between these unsent letters that we have uh, discussed tonight? Hmm. I, I was thinking uh, that of a convergence between the role of omniscience in the Holy One in the Seven Letters of the Apocalypse and what Ben was talking about with um, uh, the eyewitness accounts, that there's, there's this uh, kind of perfor performative knowledge, performative presence that the, that the letter uh, creates. In that sense, I, I, that's one convergence, I would think. Mm -hmm. Well, questions are pouring in already. Do you want to take us to some questions, Esther? Absolutely. Um, can I remind folks to keep themselves on mute when they're not talking because we're getting a little bit of feedback? Thank you. Uh, so the first question is from Udi Latipu. Um, a question to all panelists. According to the standard view in New Testament scholarship, many of the New Testament letters, especially the so-called Catholic letters, were also unsent since they are not authentic letters, but teaching written in an epistolary, in an epistolary format. What, in your view, made the epistolary genre so effective or useful that it was so popular? Okay, it's a question open to everyone and anyone who wants to grab that possibility. Um, I haven't thought very much about it, but um, I guess there is a certain different difference. If you have a, a situation, the more na na the known names and so on it's more diff it's a more difficult hypothesis in a way um, um, but uh, circular circular letters or catholics in that way yes but um, if you can like have these uh, traditions so they are connected to to uh, to to a situation and and and, and person it's uh, a bit more difficult with the hypothesis, but yes, I think it's possible. Anyone else who wants to respond to this question, Greg? Sure, I would just note that, um, I mean, in terms of to uh, Oti's question of what made the genre so effective or popular or useful, um, I think a major component of that is precisely what Professor Wright was just referencing, which is that kind of sensation of getting access to something that you otherwise might not have access to. Uh, there is certainly a rhetoric of the letter as something that was originally only for the eyes of whoever the addressee uh, is. Um, and so I think this in certain contexts and something like the Catholic epistles could certainly be uh, the case. It heightens attention to the teaching inside the letters um, because it is sort of rhetorically appealing by its very form to the readers that they are getting access to something that is uh, specially privileged information. And we see in other outside of the New Testament and other contexts, uh, this working for esoteric philosophical ends and other sorts of um, other sorts of uses. Can I just add that that um, we shouldn't speak of letters as being uniformly and across the entire geography of early Christianity as being the most uh, perfect uh, uh, form of text. I mean, there were other uh, places in Egypt and Syria and and uh, the, the Western Christianity where they did not use letters, they used oral traditions or they used uh, teachings of, of uh, saints and things like that and, and narratives. So we should, we should always contextualize this, this popular letter genre, I think. I also came, came to think about the very variant I spoke about earlier to the Ephesians and uh, you have this textual uh, maybe I mean, one theory is that it was adapted to a wider uh, circle of readers, because when you remove such addresses, 
it's a, a wider circulation, so to speak. That's also interesting that you can have textual variants that uh, adapts so they, they can be more pop in popular use. Yeah, but just I was thinking also, though, the issue of um, authentic letters, right? One of the problems is how do we tell if something is actually intended to be a letter if it doesn't have all the standard salutation? Like David's letters in Revelation don't have standard epistolary greetings, or but yet there's they're framed as letters, they're talked about as letters. And so, um, you know, one of the Lutz Doring's work on Jewish letters in antiquity is really quite good in this respect and thinking about how do we how do we think about what is actually a letter or not a letter. Um, and I'm not sure that, <clears throat> at least for as I look at um, the epistle of Barnab the epistle of Jeremiah and um, the letter of Aristius, that I would want to make any strong distinction between an authentic letter, whatever that might be. That is, I presume that means with a salutation and closing with the fair with the formulae that we would recognize or not. The fact that this says it's a copy of a letter of Jeremiah, which is clearly taking on the letter of Jeremiah from Jeremiah 29 none of which have standard epistolary openings or closings, you know, allows us, I think, a much more flexible way to think about these texts and the way that they then get used, as in the letter of Aristius for the whole issue of eyewitness and eyewitness account and, and verifying, right, what the, what the narrator is telling us. I think there are some more questions. Do you want to take us through some more questions, Esther? Yeah, so we had an anonymous question for Ben. Um, in what sense were letters usually private? Um, my understanding was that they were usually read out loud, often by a slave rather than the recipient. Yeah, and what I mean by private is simply that um, the way the the way Aristius is framed is from one person to another. That the, the way the way that it's it's um, portrayed with, especially with the two unsent letters of. I already sent you this other thing, and there's another one coming later. Is is simply to say that it was um, this is a correspondence that's meant to be from a single person to another person, and not to be circulated widely for other people to read. So um, that's really all I mean by private in that respect. Um, and so I still think I still think that um, it does have some of that allure that, that, that Greg was also mentioning of, you know, we're, we're getting access to stuff. And so here in Aristius, we have a Gentile, we have a, it's, it's, a, it's a weird text, right? I mean, we have a Jew writing a text as if he's a Gentile saying really good things about Jews. And, and so what you end up there is you have access to these elite Gentiles who are saying how much they admire the Jews and how much the Jews' law is just like the same. They do what what we do. They're they're about ethics and morality. And yeah, they have food laws, but the food laws aren't really food laws. They're really about about justice, etc. And so we're we have access to this. Um, I'll put scare marks around it. Private conversation, which I think heightens the interest in what's being said here. So hopefully that answers your question. And um, I think there was one for David, Esther. Yes, uh, for David from Anne-Marie Lundeck. Um, are the specifications of the places of address in Revelation also related to the Pauline specifications and perhaps a kind of mockery as in the case of Revelation 2-3, I know where you live? Uh, it's possible. Um, they're, they are major but not the only cities in Asia Minor. People have tried to, to give some kind of structure to, like a circular structure to the various uh, locations, but I, I don't know whether uh, we could like pick out those particular cities as having more or less Pauline influence. So thank you, Emily. And there is another question from Anne-Marie, this one for Greg. Um, I really like the paper. You can textualize the Mary and Ignatius correspondence with second century correspondences, et cetera. What about later exchanges, such as between Jerome and Paula and Eustochium? Yeah, thank you, Anne-Marie. This is a wonderful question. And this is precisely the where my thinking is going as well in trying to understand what uh, 
how Ignatius is being staged in the long recension in late antiquity. We don't know exactly when this um, version of the collection came together or was composed, but many people do place it in the fourth century. So Jerome's correspondence with Paula, uh, Chrysostom's correspondence with uh, Olympias also comes to mind. Um, Evagrius writing to Macrina, there are plenty of examples. Why I mentioned the, um, the, the, the letter collections of the second sophistic is because those are collections in which we have both a woman writing and a reply. So we have this kind of both sides of the correspondence preserved within a letter collection, even though it might be a fictional letter collection. Um, and so I was kind of making that on the level of a literary comparison. But yes, yeah, certainly uh, for the historical contextualization of the Ignatian long recension, this is precisely the, uh, the right place to go, I think. Uh, are there still some more questions here? Uh, yes, there's a, another question for David um, if the, from Ismo Dunderberg. Uh, if the letters in Revelation are against Paul, which I found compelling, why not address them to the same congregations as Paul's letters? You know, it, again, it's, it's difficult to, to make a lot of sense out of the specific, uh, the specific cities here. Um, and I, I cannot decode the particular cities that are chosen here. Um, I suspect that um, we're dealing with uh, the prophetic imagination. Um, Patmos is pretty far off uh, from where these cities are. Um, he's imagining principal cities and his, the influence is not specifically from uh, or I guess I, I would say that the, the influence is from, from the letter collections and the idea of the letter collection. So he's not imitating Paul that closely. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't put it any closer than that. It's, it's not gonna, I, I cannot uh, tighten the relationship to these specific seven cities, um, but it's a really good question. Are we getting to the end of our question uh, list? Yeah, we are actually out of questions currently. So if you have any, there's still a couple minutes left. Mm -hmm. We Feel can hand open up to the panel if you want to comment on each other's. Um... Greg, did you want to, are you just thinking or did you want to say no, something? No, yeah, I, I have a question that I could, I could <laughs> raise kind of generally to the panel. Um, it seemed to me that we were using the, the word fictional to mean slightly different things I think, in some of our different um, presentations. And I'm wondering uh, what my fellow panelists think about how exactly we're categorizing um, these texts based on our, our understandings of their origins versus our understandings of their reception and, and function. Um, I think with both David's paper um, with the sort of fiction of these seven letters in Revelation and Ben's paper with uh, the, as you said, I think Ben, totally fictional letter of Aristius. It sounded to my ear like you were saying, I understand these letters were not actually written and sent as letters in a real sort of historical situation and should not be read as such. It didn't necessarily sound to me like you were trying to imply that readers who received these texts were understanding those letters as fictional or were in on the in on the fiction. Um, I think what I was trying to get at with the questions about the possible fictional signposts of the correspondence of Mary and Ignatius was precisely the opposite notion of fiction, which is a fiction that the readers are in on. Um, and so perhaps we need to refine our language here a little bit. Are there better categories we could be using for parsing between these different types of distinctions? Um, I'm wondering if, if anybody has, has thoughts on that. If I could jump in, I think, it's, I think it depends on what kind of battles you want to fight, right? Um, with the letter of Aristius, you know, uh, throughout scholarship, scholars just really, really reluctant to give up the idea that the letter of Aristius tells us how the Septuagint originated. They're so reluctant to give up that idea. And so I, I think it has nothing to say about that. So, so that's, the, that's the battle that I'm fighting, right? So, so I, I use the word fiction intentionally in that respect. And, and, and you, you have it completely correct. 
what the recipient, what the what the people who read, I think I think the author of the letter of Aristius was in fact trying to, you know, have whoever read this text understand that you know Gentiles get it, and whether they thought these letters were um, were uh, um, actual letters that were written between Ptolemy and Eleazar, there certainly is an attempt to frame them that way, right? So for me, the fictional aspect is about fighting a certain kind of battle that in Septuagint studies, I think um, still persists in a way that I find really problematic. So, so yeah, I, so, so you, I mean, you, you certainly, you certainly, um, uh, you, you certainly summarize the way I was using the word fiction completely intentionally, but I think, as I said, it depends on what battles you're trying to fight. I, th I think that, that um, f fiction can often mean um, the appropriation of a genre, a communicative genre, to do something very different from its most historical material function. So we, we see this often with um, imitations of stelae, like this was inscribed on a stela. And we have no idea whether this ever had, this was ever inscribed in the steel. Like I think at the very end of the, the gospel of the Egyptians from Nag Hammadi, there's a, a kind of an imitation of a, of a stela. And I would say that that's a, that's a fiction of, of origin, of textual origin. Um, and it just means that, that yes, there were stelae in the, in the world. They held a certain uh, authority that people deferred to and revered in a material sense, but that in the context of a text, um, and you brought up uh, Gre Greek romances too, in the which often use these, these, these extra uh, uh, genres, in the context of the text, it gets appropriated for very, very different purposes, whether narrative in the sense of, of uh, a pro uh, uh, fiction or uh, prophecy in the case of the Book of Revelation. And then I would say, I just want to add that Tommy's example is the purest example of fiction, because that's where, you know, a couple little narrative details or not even narrative details get turned into this incredibly delicious story about Paul's extra lives and things like that. Can I also say that, uh, and as a textual critic also, that... Uh, we, when we talk about these letters, we, for example, the Pauline corpus, we have it, we have a collection, uh, more or less, and we don't have, I mean, there are many theories about the Corinthian correspondence and so on. Uh, and and uh, there are some variants, uh, how was the original uh, letter to the Romans and so on. We, we, we have the letters in a, uh, probably uh, as a collection, and that goes perhaps also for Greg's, and we should be reminded that, that uh, we, we receive uh, the, these traditions uh, in some cases as collections or, or in other ways. And perhaps they had other forms and, and another origin and another uh, outlook uh, early on. So whatever letters were sent, they, they have not uh, come down to us in that form. Esther, are we out of time now or? Unfortunately, yes, we are out of time. Yeah. So um, I think that we will have to end then. And um, I want to um, thank again the presenters uh, for your uh, lovely presentations uh, today. And I also want to thank the audience for uh, tuning in to these webinars and to, uh, for engaging with our panelists. And I also want you to note that we will have another webinar in this series on June 8th, and it will be on the subject of books and rumors of books. Good night.